to do is sit up front and then turn around. Everybody is already here. Praise God. But me and the boys. Praise God. Well, I have to share this one in honor of my husband. He's not Catholic, but I can see him fitting into this story. So when I say the man, just think of Pastor Wall. A man goes to the confessional and begins, Father, my Forgive me, I have sinned. Well, what is your sin, young man? Well, uh, I used some bad language this week and I feel absolutely terrible. Well, when did you use such awful language? Well, I was going and golfing and hit an incredible drive that looked like it was going to go over 250 yards. But it struck a pole a phone line that was hanging over the fairway and it fell straight down to the ground about 100 yards. Is that when you swore? No, no, no. After that, a squirrel ran out of the, out of the bushes and grabbed my ball in his mouth and began to run away. Is that when you swore? No. You see, the squirrel was running and an eagle came and grabbed the squirrel in his talons and began to fly away. Is that when you swore? No. As the eagle carried the squirrel away in his claws, it flew toward the green and it passed over as a like a it passed over at a bit of forest near the green. Forest. And the squirrel dropped my ball. Did you swear then? No, no, no. Because the ball fell and stuck in a tree. But it bounced through some bushes. It careened off a big rock and rolled through a sand trap onto the green and stopped within six inches of the hole. The priest said, you missed the putt, didn't you? <laughs> Let's open our Bibles to Lamentations. <laughs> <Chapter three. laughs> Lamentations chapter 3. It's amazing how from the start of this service that our beloved Pastor JC kept them using the word hope, 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 hope. And that's our tagline for tonight. So praise God. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness and your love. We thank you for your word. Your word is true. And Lord, as we acknowledge the fact that it is truth, we can stand on it. And you take us through those difficult times. And we thank you. We praise you. And we just ask you now to anoint your word tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. The word lamentation, of course, lamentation is a, a passionate expression of grief. 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 And how many have ever seen any demonstrations on TV or whatever of Jewish people grieving? They really know how to grieve. I mean, they weep and wail, they'll throw dirt on their head. I mean, they really, it really is a very stressful time. And um, this book, although some say that an author later on put it together, this particular chapter is really the heart of Jeremiah. You see what's happened is that for 40 years, he'd been telling the people, yeah, God, you've got to turn. God's going to judge you. That beautiful temple you're bragging about, it's coming down. This whole city's going to be wiped out. And, and they just said, talk to my hand, talk to my hand, right? And but they, he knew the day was coming, and it came. I mean, and he witnessed it. You have to remember that the Babylonians had a siege where they built like a giant bowl constrictor around that city of Jerusalem. And the people that were camped inside the city running out of food. The Bible even records the fact that they shared babies to eat, cannibalism. They were desperate. Jeremiah saw all this. And so what we have in chapter 3 really is, it's almost like Jeremiah has just kept it all inside of him, and now he, he's going to break forth. And I think he himself is grieving, but I think it also might be a picture, hopefully, of what Jerusalem is going to grieve as a result of that. So it's something we're going to take a look at. And um, grief for the Jew was the strongest word for agonized mourning. And so there's desperate, desperate thing. So what we're going to look at tonight is this whole idea of grief. You know, remember Job? 
all that he lost everything. Well, let's let's decide right now. We're not going to be like his quote friends. Remember his friends? They did, they did well for one week, didn't they? They sat and they were with him as he grieved and told oh, me. But then they opened up their mouths and just started lecturing at him, said, the reason why you're doing it, we don't want that. We need to realize tonight, my friends, that to grieve is a natural response. It's something that we do when something difficult comes. There's aspects of it. We need to take a look at it. There's effects on us and so forth. So tonight, let's just take a look a little bit at this. So let's take a look at Lamentation, chapter 3. And let's just begin with number 1. And the first thing we're going to realize is when you grieve, you're only thinking about what's going on and you're only thinking about yourself. Look at Lamentations 3, 1 through 3. I am the man who has seen affliction by the rod of his wrath, referring to God. He has led me and made me walk in darkness and not in light. Surely he has turned his hand against me time and time again throughout the day. When you're hurting, you're preoccupied with your pain. You are just wrapped up in it. C.S. Lewis lost a wife. He wrote about it. And one of the things that he said was, he described it as a monotonous treadmill march of the mind around one subject. One subject. So when we grieve, it really affects the whole person. And it does affect you physically. Look at verse 4. Look at verse 4. He has aged my flesh and my skin and my flesh and my skin and broken my bones. When you are grieving, you are so down, you don't want to move, you don't want to get out of bed, you just want to, you just, you, you're wiped out, totally. Um, I can't help but think of, in the Old Testament, remember how um, Jacob grieved when the brothers came back with that beautiful coat of many colors that they dipped in blood and said, sorry, Dad, the animals must have got a hold of Joseph. He's no more. Oh, and the father who loved Joseph so much just grieved and wailed and it just totally wiped him out. Then I couldn't help but think of, um, of David. Remember when Solomon, not Solomon, excuse me, uh, David and his Absalom, his beautiful son, he told Joab, and I still have all the Joab, protect my son, go get, but protect my son, but no, Joab killed him. And Mary came back and said, all is well, David, your enemy Absalom, your son is dead. What did he do? Oh, Absalom, Absalom, my son, my son. He grieved so much, he pulled himself within himself, and so much so that finally, Joab says, David, you're the king, you gotta come out, you gotta start doing your job. So I'm telling you, when you grieve, it completely wipes you out. It completely wipes you out. And it was C.S. Lewis that said, no one told me about the laziness of grief. You just don't want to do anything. Anybody been there? And when we talk about grief, it doesn't have to be the death of a dog or an animal or a person. You can grieve the loss of whatever. I grieve the loss of when he divorced me. Tremendous grief. Tremendous grief. Whenever there's there's something happened that hits you, I, I only wish that our, our poor widow was here tonight to hear this. But it's a very difficult time. Look at 5 through 8. 5 through 8. And we see how it hits you spiritually. He has besieged me and surrounded me with bitterness and woe. He has set me in dark places like the dead long ago. He has hedged me in so that I cannot get out. He has made my chain heavy 
Even when I cry and shout, he shuts out my prayers. You are so down that, you know, your God, as far as he is concerned, he's 10 million miles away. You have this idea of being stuck. You don't have any future. Never is going to get better. God simply can't be reached. It's like the door is slammed in your face. And the catch 22 is, God really, he needs God to comfort him, but he's so caught up in his own grief that he can't even reach out for God. That's what it's like to be in deep grief. There's psychological dimensions to it. Look at verse 10. He has been to me a bear lying in wait like a lion in ambush. It's kind of like psychologically, it's like, yep, yeah, he's just waiting to pounce on me. You know? And so we psychologically think, I just like, pouncing on me. Jeremiah was not prepared. This happened. Now think about it, you guys. He knew this was coming. He knew it was coming. But he wasn't prepared for what he was going to face. The harsh reality of death and tragedy is that we are never prepared. C.S. Lewis said, it's different when the thing happens to yourself, not to others, when it's reality and not your imagination. When something tragic happens, I remember the phone call I got from the hospital, your husband's been in a motorcycle accident. Whoa, I was not ready for that one. You know, I don't care. And as much as I know craziness on those roads with motorcycles, there's a chance that he's going to get hit. I wasn't expecting it, and it hit me. Um, I think the World Magazine, I like to put a plug in for it, it's kind of the news from a uh, Christian perspective. And this cover story was an interesting one. I'm not a, um, a country and western music fan. But this is a story about Granger Smith, and I don't know if anybody here even knows who Granger Smith is. Yeah. Granger Smith is a country and western singer. In fact, it's funny, when I went on YouTube to hear some of his songs, I thought I saw that he was going to be appearing over here at, uh, in Gamage, or one of the places over in, 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 uh, in Tempe. I was surprised. But anyways, he's a neat guy. He really is. He had... Um, he was traveling and so forth. He had a wonderful wife and children. And um, everything was fine until in the, in the year of tw uh, 2019, he was living pretty, I, I was living pretty large. Being a successful country music singer was everything I dreamed of since my dad took me to my first George Strait at the Alamo Dome in San Antonio when I was 16. And he went on, he was topping charts and winning awards and having a wonderful time. He was in Texas at home, and uh, he was all excited because he was with his family. He had his wife, and he had a little girl, a little boy, London and Lincoln, their names were. And he had another little boy named River. And uh, so he even said, he said to himself, soak in this moment because it won't last forever. Because in the morning he was going to have to pack up and go back on tour. But it just so happened while they were there in the backyard, they were having a good time, and all of a sudden the boys were quiet. He's thinking, where is River? And unfortunately, you read about it in the paper, they looked around and there was River face down in the swimming pool. This three-year-old precious little boy, you can't see it from here, was face down, the worst, the worst thing that could happen to anyone. And of course, they rushed him, CPR, went to the hospital. But in the hospital, when the doctors told us that River wasn't going to survive, shock overwhelmed us. Absolutely nothing can prepare you for that moment, the moment you have to say goodbye to your child. And uh, so he goes on and he says, and we, we lost Riv. I stayed home for three weeks before the decision became imminent. And then he had to go back on the road. And even as he was on the road, it just kept on coming back and coming back and coming back. And finally, um, he was on a weekend um, in December of 2019. It looked like he was coming back, almost coming to the end of this particular tour. 
And um, some of the buddies said, come on over and have a couple beers with us. They had their big trainers and their buses and so forth. So he went over and had a couple beers, and he ended up getting snuckered, and uh, as well as say snuckered. And he made himself, made himself back, made, he got himself back to his room. But you know what he said? All of a sudden, the slideshow burst into my mind again, vivid and crystal clear. My three-year-old son, River, in face down the pool, I crashed. I crashed into the water. I clenched my face. No, no, no. Big tears exploded down my cheeks and puddles on the bus floor. Pain, lament, agony. And of course, of course, JC, I thought about you and your accident with your little brother. That was the story of River. And you know, we're never prepared for this. We're never prepared for death. As much as we are warned, we know it's going to happen. As much as we really don't bank ourselves, like our friend Joseph was saying, money and happiness isn't in this world. We all agree with that. I don't care if you um, know that we're promised suffering, read it in the Word of God. You know, the Bible said, blessed are those who mourn. You know, we all know it's going to happen, death or suffering, but we're never prepared for it. Never prepared. Look at verse 19. Remember my affliction and roaming, the wormwood and the gall. My soul, verse 20, my soul still remembers and sinks within me. That's what was happening with our, with our, our Granger, with our, with our star here. No matter what, he went on, and it just kept on coming back, coming back, coming back, much like he did. But then, look what Jeremiah said would happen. All of a sudden, it's almost like you guys, listen carefully, it's like you go through this period, it's almost like a God-ordained period, but then there's a time when there's a time when you're going to feel a transition, that there just might be a different way to look at things. And look what he did in chapter 3, verses 22. Verse 10, 21. His, he remembers the wormwood and the gall. His soul still remembers that, and it sinks within me, just like a granger. This I recall to my mind. What's this? Well, it's coming. And therefore I have hope. Look at 22 through 24. Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed. Because compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I hope in him. Yes. You know, one thing I want to try to get through to you, like Walt has his things he wants to get through to you. The one thing I want you to get through, when you read scripture, God's word, and you come across some truth about God, chew on it. Put it in your heart. Stand up. Realize it. Because look at the truth that Jeremiah is saying. He's saying what? His compassions, which are woe, that's the maximum way of expressing love. Compassion. It is God's, it's the strongest expression of caring. Compassion. He says his compassion or mercies, they don't fail. They're new every morning. What does that mean? Every morning. That means God's love for you is overwhelming. And it's there for you every morning. Every morning. God is faithful. Every morning. Every morning. God's love there for you. God's there for you. God's love's there for you. And so he's reading these truths. That's exactly what the Word of God says. It says that his compassions never fail. They're new every morning. That he's faithful. The Lord is his portion. Who do I have in heaven? 
that I desire more than you. There's nothing on earth that I desire. My heart and my flesh may fail, but what? God is the strength of my life and my portion forevermore. Portion. You ever argue over who got the biggest piece, the biggest piece of pie or the cake? Let me tell you something. He gives you the whole cake. He is your portion. He's yours. You see, what happened with Jeremiah, he was able then to take his thinking, listen carefully, off of what was emoting inside of him, of going over and over and over the pain and the struggle and all of this. He was able to circumvent that pain and just choose to let God lift up his head and focus in on God. The glory and the lifter of my head. He didn't feel like it, but he chose to. Because he said he brought it to his mind. His mind. He chose to think on truth. Well, let's see. God, that's why your compassion is for me every day. And you love me with everlasting love. And you're faithful. So, what does he choose to do? I have hope. I have hope. I have hope. I have confident expectation that the promises of God are true. It's not hope in hope. It's hope in a faithful God. God is who he says he is. You don't have to create him. You don't have to drum up something. You read it, you believe it, and you know it's true. I think that's exciting. Look at verse 25 and 26. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should hope and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Wait and hope. The word, the word wait for the Jew means to be entwined, twisted together. And it's like God is the rope and we are symbolically this ribbon. And he's saying when you wait for the Lord, you entwine yourself in him. You trust what he says about you and what he is for you. You believe that that compassion is there. And let me tell you something. When you do that and you totally trust him, things change. Things change. What about, um, what about our little friend? What did he do? Let me tell you the rest of the story in regards to our little country and western singer. He said, you know, he said, I began to doubt that my dog tag Christianity was worth anything. What does he mean by dog tag? Near the service, you've got your dog tags, your ID, and then in the back, they'll let you, you put your preference. And he was a Christian. He said, that's kind of what I was. I was a Christian, went to church, knew my Bible, raised in Sunday school and all this, but I was just a dog tag Christian. After this event, and when the Lord lifted his head on that night, his life began to change. I was still grieving the loss of river, but now I was grieving with hope, hope that none of my pain was meaningless None of it was wasted. All of it was purposeful. All this light and momentary affliction was preparing me for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. I could see that now. And it's amazing what he did. When my wife Amber became pregnant with our son Maverick, we were excited, but the news didn't negate or replace the heaviness we still felt for our loss of river. We continued to have our ups and downs, natural waves of grief, 
and none of it was a distraction from the tremendous love we had for our other children. Through it all, we were discovering new depths in our emotional capacity. What we learned was that grief and joy can beautifully coexist. We are still hurting, but we were also joyful even in our circumstances, and that birthed the hope within us, a hope that wasn't fruitless. It was becoming evident that God was doing something new. He was restoring us, not by removing the fire, but by walking us right through the middle of it. In the world you will have tribulation, Jesus said what? But take heart, I have overcome the world. He found it. It's interesting. He, had made, he has made a decision to hang up the guitar. Labor Day is going to be his last tour. And you go on the net and you find people asking, why are you going to do this way? Because he's going into full-time ministry. Amen. He wants you. His burden is for the many out there that don't have hope. Don't have hope. And I thought this was beautiful. He had come off the stage and he was happened to look in his pocket. And he said, they're the same jeans I've been wearing on stage the night before. I didn't I don't remember anything or anyone putting it in there. It was like a little, like a napkin folded. But it must have been from a fan at the meet and greet. I unfolded it and tears filled my eyes. I read the words in scribbled writing, a scripture verse, quote, and after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself Restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. God's real. God's real. Therefore, since we're justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we've gained access, permission, into what? The grace, his unmerited love and favor, into his grace in which what? We now stand. What do you mean, stand? You're getting his new mercies every day. You're getting his new love every day. His depth, depth, depth of his heart, compassion every day. You're standing in it. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. But we also, what? Rejoice in our sufferings. Ouch. Why? Because sufferings produce what? Perseverance. Perseverance what? Character. Character what? Hope. And hope does not disappoint. The world tells you to avoid suffering. Smother it with a, a substance. Smother it by doing something stupid and crazy. But how many know you can't smother it, can you? But don't deny yourself a time of grieving. Go through that. And as Walt always says, you have closure. But remember the truth of the Word of God, His rich promises. You read them, and what's going to happen this year is going to go down to here, and you're going to realize, I have hope. I have hope. Father, we thank you so much, God. Lord, we just thank you for the testimony of Jeremiah and all that he went through, the pain and the suffering. And yet in the midst of it all, he could brag about who you are and establish the hope that he has in you. We thank you, Lord, so much for Granger Smith. We ask a special blessing about him and his family as he pursues his new adventure. We just thank you, God, that out of our grief and our sorrow comes resurrected life. May each one of us, God, think accordingly so that we can be an instrument of light in this dark, hopeless world. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes, amen.